Um, okay. Thank you, Anna. Okay, I think um, I think we'll get started uh, now. And uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Margie Mendel, and I'm the uh, director of the Carl Polanyi Institute of Political Economy here in Montreal at, uh, at Concordia University. And I want to welcome you all this morning to our first webinar of 2022. So today is 22 to 20. 22. So it's an, a good day, an ominous day. Um, I'm delighted uh, to welcome Professor Yohai Benkler from Harvard University. I had the pleasure of meeting Professor Benkler a few years ago. I, I can't think pre-pandemic, but it was a couple of years before the um, pandemic when Montreal was um, preparing a declaration on uh, artificial intelligence, uh, socially responsible artificial intelligence. And that declaration was actually uh, signed and, and issued. And I think it's one of the only declarations from a, a city of its kind. And at the time, Professor Bankler uh, was invited to give a keynote address. And while he didn't make direct reference in his talk to uh, Carl Polanyi, I heard, I, I, I heard Carl Polanyi running through his talk, uh, uh, which was really a, a political economy of law talk, which is, I, I believe where he's, he's going to take us, uh, take us uh, today. I'd like to just say a few words about Professor Benkler before, um, before we get started. Uh, he is uh, Berkman Professor of Entrepreneurial Legal Studies at Harvard Law School and faculty co-director of the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. Uh, since the 1990s, <clears throat> he has written extensively on the information commons and freedom in the networked economy and society. His book, and there are many, but the book, The Wealth of Networks, How Social Production Transforms Markets and Freedom, which was published in 2006, received academic awards from the American Political Association and the American Sociological Association. He also received the McCannon Award for Social and Ethical Relevance uh, in Communications. In 2012, he received um, a Lifetime Achievement Award from Oxford University in recognition of his contribution to the study and public understanding of the internet and information, good, uh, information goods. His work is socially engaged, winning him the Ford Foundation Visionaries Award in 2011, the Electronic Frontier Foundation's Pioneer Award for 2007, and the Public Knowledge IP3 Award in 2006. Professor Bankler has advised governments and international organizations on innovation policy and telecommunications, and he serves on the boards or advisory boards of several nonprofit organizations engaged in working towards an open society. Uh, you can see, um, you can consult our website, the announcement, which um, lists many of his publications and also gives you uh, the website to which you can go to see uh, more about uh, Professor Bankler. I just want to make a brief comment uh, about his recent work, uh, which I had the privilege to to read um, his recent work, which builds on, I think, uh, Carl Polanyi's economy as an instituted process. Um, in, Professor Bankler analyzes in this work, the role of law and legal theory on structuring capitalism, demonstrating how law is one of the primary systems structuring social relations of production in the economy, authority in the polity, reproduction in kinship and meaning making in culture. His work, Professor Bankler's work, is contributing to an emerging law and political economy movement. Um, his uh, talk today, his lecture today, will draw upon uh, this recent work. Professor Bankler, I now turn it over to you and once again on behalf of the Institute. Welcome. I'm delighted to have you with us. Oh, excuse me. Everybody, please put on your mute. I was told to say, remind everyone. So, so 
I'm enormously grateful for this uh, <clears throat> remarkably generous introduction. I'd like to meet this guy if I if I ever get a chance. Uh, but um, uh, let me let me start, and I'll go for between forty five minutes and an hour, and then hopefully that leaves us plenty of time for conversations. Um, So <coughs> this uh, 99 image from Robert Fogel's American Economic Association presidential address captures a certain conception of the transformation of the world in the last between two and 500 years, capturing two major points in the process. One is the dramatic discontinuous change that the world has undergone in terms of the explosion of population reflecting in this mainstream image increased human welfare, driven overwhelmingly by technological uh, change. The, <clears throat> the more a, a, a precise, less stick figure version still is very similar, and it anchors, uh, let's say, uh, 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 the most common and mainstream conception of how this happens, starting probably with Locke and certainly with Smith, uh, with the commercialization hypothesis. What we're seeing is the gradual working out of a universal natural tendency to truck, barter, and exchange. Human beings, once treated as juridical equals, become free to pursue their own project in fulfillment of their own natural self-interest. And this natural rights conception, locating self-interest at the center, is what permits this explosion in uh, production and human well-being. At the other end of the spectrum, focused on the fact that this also coincides with um, um, uh, the beginning of European uh, uh, global colonization is the position that fundamentally what's happening here and what we're seeing here is a sustained extraction by the West of the rest with material extraction from colonization, with enslavement, and eventually with a form of dependency theory and continuous exploitation of global markets. Now, when we shift from looking at population to looking at a much more ambiguous and problematic measure, GDP per capita, that nonetheless gives us uh, at a bare minimum insight into transitions towards heavily market mediated societies measuring transactions, we see <clears throat> things that are inconvenient for either the commercialization hypothesis or the pure power, pure extraction, global extraction hypothesis. From the commercialization hypothesis, Italy should have been there first. France has no reason to be behind the UK, let alone the Netherlands. Portugal should have been there earlier. All of them precede England and the Netherlands in the gradual accumulation story. Similarly, for the pure extraction story, <clears throat> Portugal and Spain should have been way ahead of England and, and, and the Netherlands, particularly Portugal, which already uh, uh, not only dominates the slave trade, but uh, invents the model of Atlantic sugar plantations worked by African slaves selling into European markets. So something else is going on. We begin to capture what that thing is going on by looking at the other thing Fogel focused on, the, the agricultural revolution. And what we're seeing when we look at the change in agricultural output per worker and per acre is that there is a discontinuous transition in England around 1650. And the other thing, obviously, that the, that the extraction hypothesis doesn't uh, um, um, uh, the pure extraction hypothesis doesn't play out, 
with is, is the overwhelming dominance of the Baltic trade, grain, peat, bulk trade, herring fisheries, shipbuilding to support those relative to the VOC, uh, uh, the, the Dutch East India Company in the Netherlands. So we need a somewhat different story. And the most sophisticated mainstream story, the most sophisticated contemporary Smithian story is the version of Asimoglu and Robinson's new institutionalism. The idea is essentially that the Atlantic port nations, Portugal and Spain, England and the Netherlands have an advantage in global trade because Portugal and Spain are somewhat more absolutist. The merchants in, the, in England and the Netherlands are able to push back for more what they call inclusive economic institutions, private property, rule of law, and for more inclusive political institutions. And this early small difference drives their early emergence. Critically, what this does is it locates the critical move in these universally applicable model of institutions, inclusive economic institutions, primarily private property and rule of law, often associated but not necessarily with public infrastructure and education, coupled with inclusive political institutions to constrain the ability of a state strong enough to protect private property from undermining uh, investment. There's one right path. There are two major problems with this. The first is, <clears throat> It doesn't give us any purchase on variation within capitalist economies. We know that long-term top incomes dropped and flattened in France, in Germany, in Sweden, in, in Japan. We know that the US and, and the UK saw a dramatic compression and then extraction. And we know that the US has a distinct pattern of power of the 1% and extraction of the 1%. So there are real variations within capitalist economies and this model of one right path doesn't solve us. Um, it also doesn't tell us why the US has not only higher inequality but also lower intergenerational mobility than any of the other industrialized parties. So we need an approach that will give us a purchase on the question of what is the difference between Denmark and Alabama two market societies integrated into more or less perfect unions, and something that won't simply ignore or refract through rose tinted glasses, the actual observed pervasiveness of exploitative institutions throughout the history of capitalism. And for this, we need to go broadly speaking into a cleaned up Marxian frame for which I think Polanyi gives us the best uh, anchor. Um, we're looking for something that moves us towards a more historically distinctive, less natural explanation of the rise of capitalism, but also one that doesn't need to be purely state-centric. And here we start essentially with Polanyi's uh, uh, core uh, historical statement in The Great Transformation, that what we're seeing is a historically specific discontinuous tra transition where in all pre-modern society, economic activity is embedded in social institutions, law, religion, tradition. Critically for our purposes here, the point is that production or social relations of production, the economy, is part of a single system with social relations of reproduction or kinship, social relations of meaning making or culture, mostly religion in the past, and social relations of authority or the polity. So if you just look at English land tenure at the very beginning of what's going on, and you look at the form of land tenure revived by the Tudors in order to produce a strong fiscal independence, again, pursuing feudal interest of a monarchy versus its, its, its uh, potential aristocratic um, um, competitors. This is a land tenure that Henry VIII imposes on almost all land sales from the dissolution of the monastery, reviving it from two or 300 years of having been largely abandoned. And it combines, you control the land, but, you the, but, but only largely in terms of life's 
and uh, subject to customary rents, embodying fealty in social relations of authority, presenting control over social relations of reproduction through the rights of wardship or the rights of the Lord to control the marriage of, of um, um, uh, minor children of a, a deceased ten, uh, uh, Lord. Uh, so we see the adoption at the very moment of the most restrictive form of land tenure that binds closely social relations of authority kinship, and kinship with the economy. And the same thing happens in the peasant customary tenancies where essentially what we're seeing is peasant possession that is stable, worked by family members, and that after the Black Death becomes uh, retreats from bondsmanship and fealty, but nonetheless is informed by custom through local manner and only formalized later over the course of the, the latter 16th uh, century. <clears throat> Trying to put a little bit of order that will allow us to keep control of changes and, and to be able to produce an accounting of changes over time. Let's look at the core building blocks of production. We're looking at the question of labor, who works with whom, resources, on what resources and projects over time. So working with resources over time subject to community is the core set of building blocks of what makes social relations of production. And when we break down into it, labor at the core is human effort deploying embodied knowledge over time on resources with other, that's work, which depends in the terms of labor on coordination and cooperation, that's the with others part, that is largely happening through two mechanisms. One, pure coordination in the division of labor among smallholders. The other, leveraging sociability, some version of Zittlichkeit or another, into, with division of labor into organization, which is formalized and habituated coordination and cooperation. The resources in turn can be understood of as material or cognitive with the material being nature, land, flora, fauna, minerals, Cognitive primarily being the stock of social knowledge. None of us learn from scratch. We all live in inherited material and social context. And in combination, this is the stock of tools or technology, congealed practical knowledge embedded in material culture. But it takes time to move from the moment you conceive of a project to the moment at which you can actually eat its fruit. And essentially we have two major, analytically two major ways in which to manage time and resources. One is savings, that is to say the past embodied, used in the present to bridge time from conception to execution to consumption. Or credit, that is to say a call on social resources for use in the present to bridge the time from conception and execution, et cetera, in expectation of future production. These are our two primary modes. We think of them today only in money, but fundamentally they should be understood as, as ways of managing time between when you conceive of a production project to begin to produce and when you can actually consume it and live with it. And then subject to contingency, <clears throat> which either is knowable or unknowable, either risk or uncertainty, if it's risk, we can deal with insurance or precaution. If it's uncertainty with precaution, and again, we need to deal with residual gains and losses, uh, which, which is either social insurance or in, by the time you get to, to corporate law, shares of unsecured creditors. The core point in Polanyi's embeddedness claim is that all of these are embedded in social relations of reproduction, meaning and, and um, authority, reciprocity, custom and tradition, householding in families, fealty and feudalism, guild rules, all of these control the relation between and within labor and on resources. Time is managed through usury and religion with communal mutual aid, that is to say, embedded in social relations of meaning and reproduction. 
but limited by Malthusian dynamics. And similarly for residual losses, deeply embedded in religion and charity, subject to cycles of personal ruin, really an imperfect um, uh, safety net, if you will. The core thesis of Polanyi in this regard is that a causal, historical, is that elaborate expensive machinery in localized plants, the emergence of the factory system changes politics, requires that all factors of production be available on demand. And this results in the uh, um, uh, parliamentary enclosures, repeal of the poor laws, statute of artificers, you have free labor, they liberate labor to move around and go to the machinery. They liberate land to be reallocated to industrial inputs. They force the poor, force the poor to move and seek employment. But, and this is I think what most commonly people focus on and what I'm going to try to reframe for you a bit today, only gradually tapping on the brakes, beginning with the Tudor resistance to enclosures. And then in the late 18th and 19th century, the idea here is that law and institutions enable market society by commodifying land, labor, and money, but slow it down to ease adjustment by introducing friction into commodification. The role of the double movement in this framework is political and social stabilization through the dramatic dislocation caused by changes in local, in, 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 in social relations of production. So we see this when we map it as land subject to a new form of property, as labor and organization driven by that, by labor and employment law, later on we'll talk about slavery law, but also by the poor laws and vagrancy into wage labor, and by the commodification of money essentially uh, uh, transforming the component of time, of savings and, and, and uh, credit. The second movement, as it were, is focused on these uh, laws related to uh, 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 the constraint of the Tudor poor laws, the Steenham land later on. We all know the story from Polanyi, from the Great Transformation uh, uh, itself. A major critique of Polanyi that requires that we rethink is Ellen Wood's question, but what accounts for the emergence of large machinery? What drives the transformation of technological innovation? And her work building on Robert Brenner's focusing on it being the transformation of property relations, not by creating incentives to grasp opportunities, but by forcing both workers and owners of land and capital shifting from a concept of market as opportunity, which has always existed on the peripheries of pre-modern economies to a, a market imperative. So here I'll go very quickly on a model that I hope you know, and if you don't know, we can talk about it and elaborate later. Basically the driving force is violent struggle between lords and peasants over violent, uh, over coercive extraction pursuing feudal interests. In Eastern Europe, the lords win and surf them, in, surf them in Europe to the late 19th century. In France, the peasants and absolute monarchy gain a, a victory over the aristocrats who end up becoming the, the, the proto-civil servants and, the, uh, and, and peasant family production remains peasant property and really postponed and, and householding remains the central mode, postponing industrialization until competition with England forces transition uh, uh, and industrialization only in the 19th century. Whereas in England, you have this, this intermediate resolution with the Lords demilitarizing earlier, the peasants losing some of their customary rights, some of the commons being enclosed and primarily the Lords converting more land from customary tenancies to market priced flows and rent which leads to the emergence of the yeoman as some succeed in renting more land and as they all come under the pressure of maximizing rents because they've moved from customary fixed rents to, to floating rents. Capitalism emerges in agriculture as an unintended side effect of feudal lords pursuing their own feudal interests and peasants pursuing their own peasant interests. 
but in subjecting the basic means of subsistence to market imperatives, this then drives improvement and intensification, which creates new political actors and interests and new agents and dynamics for institutional change. Borrowing here from, a, from a, 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 a something that Tala Sayed wrote on the vertical and horizontal in capitalism, it's helpful to think of a particular relationship between it not being just vertical, not just being landlords extracting farmers or wage laborers and not, uh, but rather that each horizontal class has its own internal imperative. The landlords are competing to find productive farmers so that they can maintain socially respectable consumption. This is importing Veblen into the Polanyi framework. They risk losing land to debt if they don't raise productivity. So they're forced to look for the most productive farmers. The farmers now suddenly, um, uh, and, and you see a little bit in the, in the emergence and, and, and collapse of some of the lesser gentry into the farmer class, that there are real up and down stakes in, in losing that. The farmers have to compete by increasing productivity so their neighbors don't outbid them and, uh, uh, and then they drop into wage laborers. And the wage laborers are forced to sell their labor or have no food or shelter because of the removal of subsistence. So it's this particular interaction between horizontal imperatives and, 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 vertic and the risk of vertical collapse that is driving uh, uh, continuous improvement. Uh, so the model here is that the double movement can move, enables by commodifying, but the double movement is not just about political and social stabilization, rather it provides us with a framework to think about stable differentiation among capitalist societies and periods. Decommodification the battle over commodification and decommodification of a market imp as imperative and market as opportunity alters the balance of power in market societies, not just slows down transition. Expanding this model, we can essentially think of the double movement as a continuous dynamic of battles over power and productivity played out on the terrain of institutions, ideology and technology. The struggles over how much of production is embedded uh, 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 in social relations in other dimensions and how much it's disembedded. That is to say embedded markets as opportunity as opposed to disembedded markets as imperative entails struggles over market power, over market reach, over market structure, within inherited social relations of production, reproduction, meaning, and authority. That's how market societies have always operated. They emerge this way and they continue to function. And I'll try for the remainder of the talk to show both the emergence and the continuation within regime and between regime. And they're driven by strategic action of groups and actors in market society. The result, if we take a different version of this, of this kind of, of, of mapping of, of high inequality, low intergenerational mobility, low inequality, high intergenerational mobility models, the societies that have adopted meaningful partial decommodification of basic needs well into the middle class, the Nordic social democracies, are those with the lowest, uh, with the lowest social inequality and the highest intergenerational mobility. The liberal market democracies that have very uh, uh, strong market as imperative institutional structures are the ones that have the highest inequality and the lowest intergenerational mobility. That's a very different way of explaining uh, uh, differentiation here. So <clears throat> we need to start the story earlier in the Dutch Republic and 17th century England, not in the Industrial Revolution. And what I'll do in the next few minutes is emphasize where market as opportunity exists and focus, focusing primarily on England and how it got converted to imperative. And then eventually we'll come into how that influenced the side of enslavement and colonization. So this is the work that, that, that Professor Mendel was, was mentioning in the introduction that I'm working on now, the, the next book. Um, the basic, uh, 
dynamic is quite distinct between these two geographically very close and culturally, economically very interconnected components of the Anglo-Dutch um, 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 duality. In the Low Countries, ecological shocks and inundations dr drastically drive toward market as imperative early, forcing reliance, absolute reliance on grain trade, on the Baltic grape trade, and therefore on wage labor, uh, move shifting directly to market as imperatives very quickly, amplified both in the possibilities and in the necessities by a tripling or quadrupling of the population with the massive influx of religious and political refugees from the Spanish conquest of the Brabant and Flanders, from the battles in France, uh, uh, and the arrival of, of various dissenters from both England and France. This results also, this results in a dramatic increase in uh, dependence on markets to produce, to feed this population, and in connections, opportunity, um, uh, capital that's being imported with these refugees. There's a massive Anglo-Dutch uh, cultural flow through trade, religious refugees, and studies. Uh, at the same time, in the 16th century, the monarchy pursuing its own fiscal independence and its control over social relations of meaning making over religion leads to the dissolution of the monasteries. But again, Henry VIII and later Elizabeth sell the land, quartered land holdings in England, through uh, the most traditional land tenure, the Knights' Service. They're pursuing goals within feudal society, but so are the merchants and urban craft people who are buying into the status of landed gentry. They're buying land that is actually subject to customary rents. They can't rent money and make money off it. They're initially buying it to gain status into the gentry, but they nonetheless bring their merchant consciousness into the, uh, into the countryside. By contrast, it turns out the yeoman and the husbandman have been developing since the late, uh, uh, since the late uh, uh, 15th century, a practice of market-based transfers, primarily initially among children between non-inheriting and inheriting children. Again, pursuing peasant interests that result in morcellization in France, but building initial market rate exchanges. Jane Whittle has fantastic work on this, um, uh, looking specifically at Norfolk. Um, they then, and the lords start renting to the new gentry who brought, bringing their, 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 their consciousness into the countryside, uh, work from both ends in engrossing and enclosing. So by the middle of the 16th century, you see more yeomen and fewer husbandmen classed by size of holdings. Capitalism emerges from the middle rather than top down. Merchants moving to the country and yeomen expanding. This transforms the politics and really leads to a century of civil war all the way to the revolution of 1688 before the parliamentary enclosures. As a matter of legal structure, what is completely unintuitive to contemporary mainstream institutional economics is that all the transition to market occurs in privileges to use rather than in rights to exclude. That's where all the action is happening. Up until the, the, the 17th century, both for the lords and for the peasants, privileges to use, to live in the manor, to use the domains, to use the commons, uh, but also the open field system for the peasants, the use of the commons and ways, privileges to use are where all of the actual production happens. The right to exclude is a periodic and cyclical subject to a variety of rights. And all of the market in the, almost all of the market in the, the 16th through the middle of the 17th century is happening in, in uh, uh, privileges of use, not in right to exclude. And it's all happening in the privileges of use of the underneath the much more uh, um, uh, slow moving um, uh, formal land tenure that the aristocracy and the gentry are holding. And yet, 
and yet agricultural productivity per worker and per acre takes off discontinuously in 1650, a period where there's still about a hundred years worth of market as opportunity because even though more of the land is being enclosed, roughly 25% of the land is still open as commons and it's providing subsistence to roughly two thirds of the peasantry. So you have this hundred year of market as imperative Critically, from the, again, from the perspective of the claims of the new institutional economics, is that um, uh, most of the improvements are happening in a market as opportunity context. Measuring less than a quarter, in some cases, not much more than 10% of the increase in productivity by 1800 is not differentiated between those areas that are still open fields and those that are enclosed. The primary driver is a new national seed a new market in national seeds and, and, and expansion of irrigation and manuring practices around the emerging ideology of improvement deployed at least as much in, in, in many of the areas by peasants in the open field system as it is by farmers in enclosures. This is one way in which we can explain the story between Spain, Portugal, and France and England and the Netherlands. That is to say, we move where you have colonial expansion and slave trade, moving into a non-capitalist state of, of, of uh, the internal economy, that money is spent either on conspicuous consumption, essentially on reinforcing status hierarchies, or on reinforcing coercive power, arms and armies. You don't get transition to capitalism. You don't get continuous investment uh, in the way that you do in Britain. By contrast, when you take this colonial expansion, both the material uh, wealth and the slave trade and the commodities that then are grown, tobacco, etc., and sugar, this form of primitive accumulation becomes the booster fuel for the Industrial Revolution only when it's fed into a system that already has the market as imperative, the engine of continuous productivity improvement. The investments in improved productivity, the move to machinery, industrialization, the, uh, uh, and the change in ideology, the consciousness of improvement are what then drive um, um, uh, industrialization in England, but not before one last piece. And that's the active investment of the already capitalist landowners and farmers in producing agricultural proletarization as a political struggle in a body they control. And let's talk about that. So as background, when we look at the period from 1650 to 7050, the period I just described to you as market as opportunity, inequality decline, or in this case, the way that is shown equality rises, real income equality based on, on, on ratios of, of work to, to a basket of basic goods in various classes. Real inequality declines from 1650 to 1750 by about 25%. In the following 50 years, it doubles. This is the period, the core period of the parliamentary enclosures, and it takes another 150 years of emergence of labor politics and um, uh, modern uh, uh, redistribution before Britain reaches the same level of, of inequality as it had in 1750. Coming back to the mainstream, let's, this is the core of what Asimoglu and Robinson have to say about the parliamentary enclosures. Common land could often be used only for traditional uses. We'll see in a moment, traditional uses are subsistence for the majority of rural population. There were enormous impediments to using land in ways that would be economically desirable. We've seen that over three quarters and in some places, in many places, 90% of the improvement actually happened irrespective of enclosure. Parliament began to change this, allowing groups of people to petition parliament to simplify and reorganize property rights. Who are these people? This is a profoundly undemocratic institution at the time, completely controlled by the agricultural uh, um, 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 landlords 
and, and large tenant farmers. So you're looking at extinguishment of privileges of use and, and um, uh, exclusive rights to subsistence in the favor of those who control the land. So what are we looking at? So this, the, the, the uh, uh, fundamental work here is Ivy Pinchbeck's in 1930, but there's a lot of work from Jane Humphreys, from J.M. Neeson, pasture, mostly for smallholder production for local markets, energy, absolutely critical in the household, wooden peat in the household uh, um, um, uh, budget, construction materials, marginal housing, squatting and cottages, marginal housing of last resort, and basic food stuff supplementing the purchase of grains, gardens, small scale hunting and gathering, gleaning. By these both Pinchbeck's older and Humphrey's newer, about half of household production budget, house of half of household production for the rural population comes either from direct production or from production for local uh, markets uh, uh, for money, overwhelmingly worked by women and children. So the parliamentary enclosures were primarily a power-seeking move by a small minority that controlled parliament, who consciously argued in terms of increasing the dependence of, dependence of agricultural workers on wage labor and doing the ideological work to denigrate the commons as a matter of principle. So again, taking here from, from J.M. Neeson's uh, uh, marvelous work on the commons, let me give you a few examples. She's quoting one of the reporters of the Board of Agriculture, John Clark. The farmers in this country are often at a loss for laborers. The enclosure of the wastes would increase the number of hands for labor by removing the means of subsistence in idling, in idleness. Other reporters explained how the commons allowed workers to collect peat and wood for fuel, either for use or sale, and how this forced farmers to pay high wages and limit the length of the workday. This attack on the integrity and humanity of the commoners, commoners, a sordid race like spiders, buccaneers of the country, whose alleged self-sufficient industry and independence were a lazy industry uh, and a beggarly independence. This, the next point really plays out, and I'm happy to go into it in some of the judicial decisions around this. But they, can't, they shouldn't be compensated because they're commoning without a right and were therefore by definition thieves. Remember, it's a use privilege rather than an exclusion right. There are internal debates within law to justify, uh, uh, there, there are manipulations that some of the opinions make to emphasize the absence of exclusion right as itself an absence of right, which is obviously not true given the long-term um, um, uh, stable customary privileges to, to use, for example, in gleaning. They even developed the, 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 the arguments that, that um, uh, um, uh, years later would become the economics of superstar that are the mainstream excuse for the explosion of the 1% here, where John Clark writes, but one man to have so large a tract of land and so many people obliged to obey his orders. To this it is replied that in farming as in most other occupations, men of the greatest talents generally get to the head of their professions while others are left by the way Sherman Rose in 1980, uh, Economics of Superstar, uh, there you go. And at the time, everybody knew that what was going on as this uh, uh, quote from, from an opinion piece uh, uh, um, in, in uh, uh, the news at the time, uh, when, you when we consider the great number of members of both houses who have had occasion to apply to parliament on the same business for themselves, we cannot wonder at the almost constant success these applications went with. So everybody at the time knows exactly that this story that Asimoglu and, and Robinson and the new institutionalist tells about, uh, about parliament having, being an inclusive political institution that imposes inclusive is just insupportable by the historical record. And again, just to emphasize, the primary workers of the commons had been women. Women and children now became the heart of the industrial workforce. By custom and destitution, lack of choice, they earned between one third and one half of male wages, which puts downward pressures initially on agricultural wage labor, forcing even more to become subsistence dependent and create the industrial proletariat. And as we see later on throughout the history of the 19th 
uh, uh, through the, the first two thirds of the 20th century, splitting potential worker coalitions, both in terms of, of, of economic pressure and economic power and in terms of political power. But what about this impact on colonization and enslavement? What about the change, the transformation in mechanized cotton manufacture intensifies demand for slavery to feed the cotton mills? So for this, we have to roll back to the early 17th century to colonization and to learn from it from Marx on Wakefield with the fundamental problem, the fundamental problem presented by planter colonization as opposed to the Spanish and Portuguese uh, model of pure material extraction or the Dutch model of armed trade, the English model of settlement and plantation to create commodity agriculture and uh, growing markets for industrial outputs depends on there being a lack of land. If in fact the absence of subsistence is what created the proletariat, what in a land of unbounded uh, land could force the workers to stay workers as opposed to become smallholders? Uh, um, uh, and that's the core of understanding capitalist social relations, not about being just about owning capital, but also having wage labor that's fully dependent. But we don't have to go to the 19th century. We can read Emmanuel Downing's letter to John Winthrop to understand the basic problem. For I do not see how we can thrive until we get into a stock of slaves sufficient to do all our business. Why? There's so much land. For our children's children will hardly see this great continent filled with people. So what? So our servants will still desire freedom to plant for themselves. They are not going to be dependent on selling their wages. And so they won't stay, but for very great wages. So we shall maintain 20 moors cheaper than one English servant. It can't get clearer than this, what's driving the emergence of, uh, eventually the emergence of, of racialized hereditary lifetime slavery. But the first response is indentured servitude. So we have good, uh, Jane Whittle's work, for example, on, 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 uh, uh, um, on village life uh, in England, indentured servitude by the 17th century has gone about to becoming something of a one year life cycle training, usually local to the community in the village, um, uh, much more of, a, of a, a, a integrated into village life. In Virginia and Maryland, it moves to being from one year to four to seven years. Punishment for disciplinary breach is the, the, the judicial imposition of more years. Tribunals fix the length of contracts that are not fully specified. Women who have sex out of wedlock have their servitude extended. Children born out of wedlock are indentured essentially until they're 31. In the first session of the Virginia Assembly, they pass a vagrancy law that is explicitly defined. If any man live as an idler or renegade, though, though a freed man, freed in this case is indentured. There are no black slaves yet. Appoint him a Then the, the plantation shall appoint him a master to serve for wages till he show apparent signs of amendment. Prohibitions on seducing away. They're taking a very aggressive version of the statute of laborers responding to the lack of, of um, uh, labor after the Black Death and imposing it as the norm here. We then see criminal deportation playing the same role initially in the US, then in Australia. It's only in the 1660s, half a century later, that we begin to see lifetime hereditary enslavement for workers of African descent um, 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 emerge as heritable by mat matrilineal descent. So in 1655, Elizabeth Keyes wins her freedom in a court case based on three arguments. Her father was English, her condition de descends from the father, she was baptized, she had a specific indenture for nine years, she wins, she becomes free. Within seven years, the Virginia legislator shifts the status by matrilineal descent and it's impossible to explain the unique pattern of US enslavement. Only 400,000 Africans were imported into the 13 colonies in the US compared to 4 million each to the Caribbean and Brazil without understanding the central role of the enslavement of black women's reproduction uh, 
uh, uh, at the heart of the way in which American enslavement work. And various other laws both were designed to denigrate status and produce status subordination, like anti-miscegenation most powerfully, and um, 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 differentiation in treatment in terms of lifetime hereditary enslavement versus uh, periodic um, 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 indenture. Barbara Fields wrote about this in a slightly later iteration about the, the, the founding, but this, is, this really is fun, fundamental. The idea that race is, is develops as an ideology born of two things. One, habitual oppression that makes you look for reasons to denigrate that other and understand the other in a denigrated way, and a way that makes sense of mutually completely inconsistent ideas. She puts it, it's those holding liberty to, liberty to be inalienable and holding Afro-Americans as slaves were bound to end by holding race itself to be a self-evident truth. When cotton mechanized manufacturing dramatically increases the demand for cotton, and when Whitney's cotton gin allows the US South to outcompete India as the world's largest cotton exporter, we see within a decade dramatic transformation of the laws regarding interstate importation, regarding hiring out, mechanisms that were put in place in response to prior uh, 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 decline and disruption in the tobacco uh, market, but also to conceptions that were, were uh, semi-feudal in their understanding of enslavement, these get rationalized as it were, creating labor markets in slave and integrating slavery into capitalism by doing two major things. One, subjecting labor to markets, even though labor is as property rather than as wage labor, but also disciplining the market, the, the, the planters to maximize commodity production because of their own dependence on credit markets. So you have this, this weird distortion that then gets reproduced through statutes, through courts that seek to legitimate it. And I'm happy to go back to uh, there, but this really shapes the politics of the United States for the next two thirds of a century and shapes uh, the politics and, and culture of the United States to the present, as we'll see. The <clears throat> big model can be reduced to a simple one in which firms, and later we'll see workers, can pursue competing strategies. And they invest to the extent they can in each one. One is to try to improve productivity. The other is to try to increase their power. And they play them over institutions, over technology, over ideology, sometimes trying to seek advantage through improvement where they can, sometimes trying to seek advantage through power when they can. They deploy horizontal power to increase the rates, increasing entry barrier to competitors, preventing any, uh, entry of innovative competitors, manipulating demand, to match supply, to prevent competition, to increase the share of rents, but also increasing vertical power, increasing competition among workers in the labor market, reducing competition among employers, increasing monitoring of employees, disrupting collective action. All of these are mechanisms that we'll see how they then play out across the different regimes in legal and institutional uh, choices. I'll talk a little bit about technology if you want uh, in Q&A. Um, <clears throat> this then really transforms the relationship between questions of, of status subordination, race, gender, immigration, and here I follow Cedric Robinson's Black Marxism, Stuart Hall's race articulation and, 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 and in, in society structured by dominance. Um, in both the, neo, the, both the neoclassical and the uh, orthodox Marxian, Marxian version, discrimination essentially is a failure of markets if all that matters is extracting value. Whereas in the context of understanding the role of status subordination as a power-seeking strategy, 
combining misrecognition and mass maldistribution actually gives employers advantage. That's why you get the continuous effort to import workers who are status subordinated, black immigrants, women and children. Um, and it's not just one way, not just firms. Workers also all the time try to, to seek power against firms, but also against other workers. And again, critical to the labor movement throughout these centuries have been tensions between skilled and unskilled workers, men and women in the US and, and Europe, white native versus black immigrant um, um, uh, continuously. And if you look throughout the history of industrialization, and obviously I'm happy to come back to this later, but in each major regime since the Industrial Revolution, there's a clear set of status subordinated workers that make the core of the workforce, of the industrial workforce at its bottom. Women and children in the UK, enslaved back work, black workers in the US South, and young women and immigrants in New England for the first Industrial Revolution. Irish Catholic immigrants in the East and Midwest, black workers in the South and Chinese workers in the West for the second Kondratiev. Um, in, in the third, it's Southern European, primarily Italians and Eastern and Central European Jews. After 1916, 1924, you get black workers on the Great Migration. In the fourth Kondratiev, you have Treaty of Detroit somewhat constraining it, but still exclusion of black workers and sending Rosie the Riveter home. And finally, women, immigrants, and the undocumented in the US, the guest workers in mainland Europe, but mostly obviously offshoring to harness workers in the global south as the exploited uh, periphery, always playing a role throughout the entire history of, of capitalism as a power seeking move. So now what I'm going to do is spend the last 10 or 15 minutes relatively quickly at a high level explaining how these battles played out as decommodification and commodification battles, focusing only in the US, bucketed into these bucket, these, these building blocks of production that I laid out initially. So <clears throat> central here, is the Homestead Act of 1862, which was an effort to decommodify land in order to decommodify labor. It was an effort to implement federal policy to create an imagined Republic of Yeoman farmers in order to relieve the pressure on, uh, uh, on East, Eastern industrial, emerging Eastern industrial proletariat, very explicitly, at least for the national reformers who were major drivers of this idea. Um, in the populists, we see savings and credit being decommodified through the land bank and the sub-treasury, both of which are trying to harness the fiscal power of the state to decommodify access to savings in the case of the land bank and to credit or basically working capital in the case of the sub-treasury to monetize that which farmers had, which is land and, uh, and annual crops. We also see the Granger laws that are the origin of public utility driven by them in many senses, as William Boyd described, as, as, as Novak described, as an effort to introduce, reintroduce an idea of a moral economy or a just price into these core infrastructural uh, uh, needs, railroads, grain elevators, et cetera. At the same time, we see the Grange, the Farmer Alliance Cooperatism, the Knights of Labor Cooperatism, trying to decommodify labor by make, integrating labor into self-governing mechanisms. However, in the long Gilded Age, big business overwhelms decommodification through a series of political battles. So the first is the transformation of, co of corporate law which I can go into the details, but it doesn't matter for our purposes now, essentially enables the managerial revolution and the emergence of the more modern corporation. It changes who takes the credit and the residual losses by making the share, by enabling the shareholders to become distributed. It allows raising of capital through distributed investments. Remember, credit is not just what we think of it today. It's about 
mobilizing social resources in expectation of future um, uh, production. And it concentrates the power in the hands of directors. And this is a core battle, both in the US around the Debs Rebellion and the major labor organization of the late 19th century and in the rise of the new unionism in England at the same time, uh, battles over the division of labor on over how much of the knowledge in production is embodied in the bodies of the workers and how much it's embodied in the tools and the machinery with workers becoming more fungible and therefore uh, weaker. In the US and the UK, we see the labor injunction playing an absolutely central role in the US successfully destroying the labor party and the labor movement through decades, 40 years of sustained deployment of federal power without process to imprison major labor leaders and break strikes by the 1920s, 25% of strike efforts are, are under injunction, together with a constitutional law that consistently defeats, consistently defeats any political successes and therefore defeats the emergence of a Labour Party. Whereas in the UK in 1906, essentially it's taken out of the hands of the judges because there's no similar constitutional role for the court. And uh, a Labour Party emerges and you get, see uh, uh, the moderate divergence between the US and the UK. And the same thing happens with tort law where the risk of massive industrialization and rapid move gets shifted from the companies onto the workers and the farmers. In the South, a series of laws primarily focused on commodifying labor, the cropping system creates debt peonage coupled with a completely new and expanded commodification of land through expanded trespass, aggressive game and closed range laws that remove subsistence farming for formerly enslaved black farmers, very focused on counties with majority. Whereas in the Midwest and the West, what you see is the populists lose. And they lose partly through politics and partly through judicial uh, constraint and distorting of their early victories in the states around trying to reconstruct a moral economy. We have a brief moment, the Great Compression, uh, uh, where a dramatic transformation in, with the New Deal, building the foundations of a middle class. In labor, we see the Wagner Act before it's curtailed in 47 by Taft-Hartley, dramatically increasing the power of labor and its freedom to use aggressive economic tools. We see dramatic increase of antitrust enforcement to weaken the power of, of, of corporations. The GI Bill has a tremendous effect on both university training and vocational schools, small business loans, housing laws. For the first decade, some, some 40% of new housing starts are funded by the Veterans Administration. We see the Federal Housing Agency um, um, creating federally insured fixed home mortgage. We see banking regulation that makes banking boring but stabilizes and opens up credit and creates a very rich ground for special purpose banks that are serving the non-rich, the thrifts, the credit unions, the savings, the buildings and loans. And we see social security, aid to dependent children, unemployment insurance, and eventually uh, in, the, in, in the great society, aid to family with de families with dependent uh, uh, children, Medicaid and Medicare. All of which we know from the work of Katznelson, of Baradaran, of, of Rothstein, built in ways to exclude systematically Southern Blacks, leaving, to, leaving us with these two patterns. One, that there's a big drop, the Great Compression, a big drop in inequality in the mid-century during the ascendance of this period, while at the same time growing uh, uh, di difference by, by uh, wealth uh, uh, by race because the foundations of middle class wealth construction are only available or primarily available overwhelmingly more to white than to black families. The great extraction from 1973 on is composed of these primarily of these two major trends. The first, 
is the escape of the 1%. One of the most remarkable thing about Piketty's uh, images is to see that even the top 10% is really overwhelmingly the top 1%, not the top, uh, certainly not the 90th to 94th. Fifth. And the complete separation of productivity growth from uh, 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 hourly compensation, uh, either median or, or mean for the bottom 80, whichever one you use, the same story happens. This happens through systematic transformations across all of these domains that squeeze the bottom, hold back the middle, and boost the top. For squeezing the bottom, central is the change from welfare to work for, to work for fair plus mass incarceration, uh, resulting in, in dramatic racialized precarity violently policed by the state to keep people down and leveraged for political identity construction of the new party of business. Uh, we see minimum wage erosion and we see an immigration policy that transitions from the Bracero guest worker program to one with very small legal and a large pool of undocumented workers readily available for uh, um, exploitation. And banking deregulation essentially kills the special purpose banks and leaves the poor at the tender mercies of payday lenders. In the middle, the driving stories are the assault on labor unions from the Reagan administration, financialization that undermines investment in labor and tech because the elites can take much, much more from non-productive activities, monetary policy that uh, since Volcker systematically emphasizes inflation fighting over full employment, leading to active management of tight labor markets to make them looser and reduce the bargaining power of labor, coupled with reduced unemployment benefits and insistence on maintaining retirement and healthcare insecurity and risk as a discipline on the middle. These then get complemented later on in this period by non-competes and trade secrets that are extended to larger portions of the working population uh, and, and uh, surveillance and platformization that make both smallholders and workers much more susceptible to, to exploitation, uh, uh, bringing the structure of fissuring all the way to the modern uh, time. And finally, escape of the 1%, I think it's really important to emphasize the emergence of the me generation, uh, which really feeds into a complete trans, uh, um, um, transferability of, of money into status and back. There's a real transformation in the 70s I'm happy to talk about. Uh, financialization and the dramatic, dramatic out of proportion expansion of income, work income to the financial professionals, coupled with corporate governance and the escape of executive pay. Both of these then create benchmarks of status competition, status sense of, of self for the entire professional and managerial class. So that what we have is a dramatic shift in self-conception from we are producing to me, backed up by change, dramatic changes in all the levers, flipping all the levers in favor of managerial and professional uh, um, 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 class workers at the expense of uh, working families, at the expense of very decentralized um, uh, investors now forced, forced to have their retirement be there. Uh, essentially, as all these toggles are flipped, firms, the, the pathway of strategic power seeking becomes much more productive than the power of productivity seeking. So instead of investing in worker training and new technologies, etc., that's expensive. It takes time to give a return. Much faster is firing more workers, offshoring, fissuring, uh, contracting uh, worker out. So that the victories of organized business in the 70s really translate into completely new dynamics uh, uh, of neoliberal capitalism in the American version. 
The result is not only the measures of inequality we see in the top slides, the rise of the 1%, the stagnation of the middle, and the uh, in dramatic increasing mortality of the working class uh, as measured by non-high school uh, or, or high school graduates, but also an increase in markups and rents as a proportion of the economy, also a dramatic decline in the number of new firms created and the number of employees uh, working in these firms and lower productivity growth than at any point in the prior 100 years. Essentially, as, as oligarchic extraction became more profitable, firms invested more in institutional, technological, and ideological context that made oligarchic extraction even easier and more palatable and increase the level of rents and their power to extract it from both workers and consumers. What does this mean for a project, a program for future transformation? The core is re-embedding the market. The absolutely necessary precondition is reviving the possibility of harnessing the state to control the market and revitalizing the social as, an, as a way of both limiting the power of the state and re-embedding the market. That means, as we've seen throughout the history, it's about reducing market imperative. You can think of it as freedom from want. Partial decommodification of basic needs and partial decommodification of labor. It means that in social relations of production, not just of meaning making, we have to actively fight status subordination, uh, particularly along dimensions of race, gender, and immigration. We have to restructure power in the economy, essentially rebalance it back in favor of labor. We have to rebuild state capacity to steer and buffer the economy, particularly in this case, addressing pu uh, uh, public goods and, and the approaching climate catastrophe. But we can't be starry-eyed about the state as though the 19th, uh, uh, nothing has happened and we don't know the limits of the state. So how do we rebuild democratic about accountability and contain state fallibilism is a major design question. How we integrate class and race and class and gender in a way that doesn't replicate the battles of the early 20th century so that we can continue to actively counter status subordination in social relations of meaning and reproduction without losing our newfound ability to do it in social relations of production. And finally, how do we increase, no, it's not gonna take everything over, but how do we get to 15, 20% of socially embedded production, whether it's purpose-driven, whether it's cooperativism, whether it's commons-based as a model. This is a big, broad agenda. I have these as examples here that none of this is pie in the sky. Some people are already working on each component of this. There are concrete proposal that don't see themselves as a single part of the whole. But my core effort in this talk was to argue that we do need to see these as interlocking components of the possibility of a new regime in capitalism that they need to be conceived and systematized based on our understanding of how capitalism emerged, how power within it was built, how regimes within capital differentiated over time and between countries, so that we're not just doing a grab bag of whoever is trying to do, but we understand what's important and what's less important and how the specific building blocks can be put on, on, uh, 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 in place that will change the internal dynamic of capitalism rather than requiring constant supervision. Because at each major regime transition, there was some shock, a war, a climate catastrophe, uh, local, not the one we have global now, um, uh, internal collapse of a, of, of, of a period. Uh, and at these moments of crashes and, and, and clashes, regimes are more open to being redesigned than they are when the regime stabilizes around a new set of institutions, technologies, and, and ideology that reinforce each other. I think we're in such a moment now. I think the rise of ethno-nationalism is very much a reaction to the collapse of neoliberalism. And I think we need this kind of comprehensive, uh, uh, um, descriptive, 
framework, a way of explaining how things work, a way of understanding what does and doesn't fit to allow us to design a genuine alternative. You could think of it as a, as a multiracial social democracy to the ethno-nationalism that's trying to replace the neoliberalism that if we don't do anything, we'll just stay there. Thank you.